Bonjour à tous et bienvenue pour... Good morning everyone and welcome to the session that we have the pleasure of organizing in the context of this conference on nature on accelerating water solutions based on nature. This is an event co-organized in the French Partnership for Water and the International Network of Organizations for River Basins. We will have a pleasure to have interpretation in three languages, French, English, and Spanish, and I would invite you to use the headsets that you were given at the beginning of the session so as to be able to follow this meeting. Two of our speakers will be speaking English and all the rest will be in French and we will start in a minute. Start this uh, session on upscaling nature-based solutions for water will start with interpretation in three languages, French, English and Spanish. We will have two English-speaking uh, speakers and uh, the other ones will intervene, make their presentation in French. So you can choose in the uh, device that uh, were, was given to you, the language of your choice. So without further ado, sans plus de cérémonie. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Eric Tardieu, who is Director General of the International Office for Water, to kickstart our event. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to everyone. And please be very welcome in this session given over to nature-based solutions and the need to accelerate their implementation. This is not a new approach in the world of water, as you know, because for some decades now we've been talking about alternative techniques to process river water, for instance. We've been talking about biological processes also for some decades, if not for more than a century, in fact, to purify wastewater. More recently, research has been undertaken on natural measures for water retention. And today, via the standardized concept of nature-based solutions, we're trying to generalize an approach, a family of solutions that would be truly important for the management of water resources. To the extent that, in fact, pressure has grown on water resources uh, more or less everywhere in the world. We're going to speak quite a lot today about pressure linked to climate change which has introduced a new degree of variability of water stress new difficulties in guaranteeing the availability of water resources, either in quantitative or qualitative terms. But let us not forget either the other pressures which also go on existing and growing, economic development, agricultural development, which are still growing in many regions of the world, as well as population growth, which is also leading to new forms of pressure being brought to bear on water resources. So as you all know here, we are not at the right speed for implementing the sustainable development goals concerning water, the whole family of SDG 6, and we need to look at a broader range of solutions so as to meet our SDGs and also, quite simply, to meet the concrete daily difficulties that populations encounter in terms of access to drinking water, farming use of water, preservation of aquatic ecosystems. Nature-based solutions would seem now to be indispensable to us in the panoply of possible solutions to implement to the extent that they contribute a degree of regulation which responds to the growth and frequency of extreme events, including drought and flooding, to come back to climate change. And the theory tells us, of course, that solutions of this nature are particularly well adapted to this type of phenomenon. But this still remains a bit theoretical. And that's precisely why we want to have a look at the idea of how to accelerate the implementation of nature-based solutions, how we might generalize such solutions. 
because that's what we'll be seeing this afternoon. But there are, I think, two big obstacles slowing us down that we should mention at the outset. The first of these is the issue of the business model of nature-based solutions, how to demonstrate their relevance and their economic efficiency. This still has to be demonstrated, made public, and communicated about on a large scale, either with political decision makers or indeed with engineers and solution designers, which brings me to the second barrier slowing us down, which we'll also have to go on working on because it's something quite important, is the availability of human resources, of the necessary skills for the design and maintenance of nature-based solutions. And here there are different interfaces and interactions between job families, companies, thematic areas that we're also going to have to accelerate so as to make the space necessary for nature-based solutions. And then finally, we'll have to balance two different security issues, water security and environmental security. This seems to us to be very important indeed in terms of con in terms of convergence in the World Water Council with some different partners who are here, the French Partnership for Water, the French Water Agencies, an initiative which, in fact, intends to promote nature-based solutions as a useful intersection or crossroads between the interests in terms of a better management of water and a better preservation of ecosystems. And I would invite you to have a look at the contents of this declaration, which has been signed. It's on the World Water Council site, or you can come and see us about it. We'll be talking about it in coming months, but I wanted to conclude here. It's, it's not, we're not trying simply to uh, do something for appearances just among technical experts. We have a family of people who are trying to respond to concrete daily challenges that confront the population pretty much of the whole world. And when we talk about nature-based solutions, what we're trying to do here is to contribute more to environmental security and water resource security for all the different uses which are vital for our countries, our populations, and our life basins. Thank you very much for participating in this session. And now let me give the floor back to Edouard to pick up on the coming speakers. Have an excellent session. Thank you, Dr. Tardieu. So, um, <laughs> we will, uh, nous allons démarrer dès maintenant. So we'll get started straight away with our first keynote speaker, Ms. Mathilde Doury, who is team leader for the Life Artisan Project at the French Biodiversity Agency. And so the first question for you, Mathilde, concerns this Life Artisan Project. What has brought the French Biodiversity Agency with its European funding to use nature-based solutions in France. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Well, when facing the climate change crisis, but also the biodiversity crisis, the French Biodiversity Agency has asked for European funding in this Life Artisan project so as to pick up speed in this area in France because, as we've already heard, these solutions already exist. In some cases, they've shown that they were quite robust, but the impact of climate change, uh, there are so many different impacts and there are so many different contexts that it seemed to us important to bring together French partners so as to continue working together on this subject. And I'll show you here how we're organized. What we saw, and this was uh, brought up again in the sixth GF report, we're already impacted by climate change in France. 1.1 degrees per average, and will certainly be above the level we're supposed to be at in 2030. So France, in its National Adaptation Plan for Climate Change, decided to prepare uh, the whole country and its different economic sectors for climate change with the idea of more than 2 degrees in 2050. 
<coughs> there are different GF scenarios which won't allow us an avoid bit plus two or plus three in 2050, but that's the timeline that we have set ourselves in France in our plan. So you see there are variable impacts, drought, flooding, uh, drop um, uh, snow cover in all of our mountain ranges, changes in urban areas, and then for our overseas territory, there will be problems of uh, territory going underwater and the frequency and intensity of cyclones. And so to respond to these challenges, we have decided to use nature-based solutions, which I have reminded you of here. Here are the definition given at the 2016 conference of IUCN. These are activities which attempt to preserve, sustainably manage, and restore ecosystems so as to meet societal challenges, human well-being, and to have net gains for biodiversity. So that's a rather theoretical concept, but it's based on practices particularly from ecosystem conservation experts, which exist for quite a long time now. So the new point of this concept is to bring together all the different aspects of restoration and conservation of ecosystems to specific societal challenges. And here what we've decided to do is to work exclusively on the challenge of adaptation to climate change. So to be succinct, let's just say that the Life Artisan Project the implementation of nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation at the national scale, so it's, it's, it's très long. That's a bit long. So we decided to do something a bit punchier. Climate is changing, adapt to nature. But we're holding on to the work artisan because as human beings we are responsible for climate challenges and for the erosion of biodiversity, but we also think we have a role to respond as artisans. So it's a bit of a play on words, and we hope that that will bring people on board. So there are quite a lot of us working on this project, 28 different partners. And what I think is notable at the French level, we have ADEM, which is the state agency which is particularly in charge of climate change adaptation issues, and the French Biodiversity Agency, which is the state agency which covers uh, biodiversity and agriculture and similar relations. So we try to bring together everyone who is covering these challenges. We also have different research agencies and uh, the IUCN to cover all the different viewpoints on this subject. We'll be working over an eight-year period with about 100 activities, including some overseas. We're working at three different levels so as to attempt to speed up nature-based solutions. We're not going to be financing these directly. Rather, we'll be creating preconditions for local partners, communities, companies, associations to be able to find funding, as we've heard before, and then to manage these solutions once they've been set up, and also to have activities which are oriented toward populations, local populations directly, because these are solutions which cannot simply be set up by technical experts. There's a whole series of consultation measures which are also necessary. Then we will have evaluation at the local level with 10 pilot sites and in the field of water because we're not only working on water in this project, but we have got some pilot sites that are particularly about water, in particular issues of restoration of marsh areas or wetlands so as to fight against floods in south, Fran south of France, not very far from here. In fact, there's one such activity. And then also the ends of uh, watersheds in Brittany. This is a region that has a big water shortfall. And that leads to problems with drinking water supply for the city of Rennes, but also for agro-food businesses. And there are problems with the quality of water as well. And we'll be working on the restoration of the ends of watersheds in farming areas. Also the same with a group in the Paris area where we'll be talking about drinking water with the, the water table there that is in danger. And then overseas we'll have another project we'll be hearing about in more detail presently. concerning natural regeneration of mangroves so as to preserve uh, them from being f totally undersea. 
So what we have here that is interesting, I think, is an evaluation also of the financial model, the, the business model, different technical aspects of consultation, and then the impact on biodiversity. We need to make sure, of course, that these solutions correspond to the climate change problem and show that they are robust and that they are possible to be deployed. So this, let me pick up speed a bit. I'm running out of time. We we're talking about human resources, and this is also very important for our project. We have one regional facilitator per region, as the name would indicate, who works full time on this subject. So as to meet with the different players in climate, biodiversity, and water who are already committed to these projects, and then go on to create a roadmap for the coming five years to see how water-based solutions can be rolled out to scale in each region to correspond to the specific challenges there. These people are also available for everyone who wants to implement their own project to preserve water resources facing climate change. We also have a whole range of resources, of networking, of training, including MOOCs, uh, web platforms which are developed by the Ministry of the Environment and which allow us to have feedback on people's experience. They have methodological reports and reports on decisions. We also have seminars and fora so that local authorities can meet together, share their examples and their difficulties, because not all nature-based solutions will succeed, and we need to understand why when they do not, and also for people in charge of these projects to have an opportunity to meet. So we'll have an event which will be important to mobilize people above and beyond the partners we already have. There will be an artisan competition this afternoon to mobilize different local authorities who have put these sessions in place, and a trophy will be awarded in Lille in January. But here we have worked very specifically on tools which will appear on different nature-based solutions for flood risks. This was done by CEPRI. And there will be a whole series of reflections on how these documents and other material can integrate nature-based solutions in the context of climate change. I will leave you the address of our site. And if you want any more information, you can find it there. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Mathilde. And we see here that it is particularly interesting to talk about capacity building and training because at the end of the day, we are expecting that professionals in environmental preservation who are here and also online be familiar with this concept of nature-based solutions and how they are applied. But it's not yet the case for local authorities or all the other players who are on the ground are meant to be applying or supporting these nature-based solutions. We need these pilot projects of a practical nature for capacity building. Thank you very much indeed for that. And before we go back to the panel, let me say I've just been told that four participants online and also indeed those who are in the room, you can use your mobile phone and the dedicated app for the conference. You select our sessions, Scaling Up Nature-Based Solutions for Water, and then you click on Open Discussion or Open Conversation, and in that way you will be able to ask your questions online. It's not happening on Zoom, but rather on the ICN app. Thank you very much for participating in that way. And let me now start by giving the floor to Bertrand Camus, who is the Director General of Suez, to ask how Suez is bringing online these nature-based solutions in its strategies. You have the floor, sir. Hello to everyone. I hope you can hear me well. I'm in Paris. I have a few slides. I think perhaps the technicians will be able to show them to you. And if that doesn't work, we'll manage without. But in Suez's strategy, which we launched in 2019, we wanted, first of all, to set forth our raison d'etre, our mission statement, which was presented to our General Assembly in May 2020. And here the idea is that we want to preserve our environment's national capital and all the different elements which compose it. Water, 
soil and air. And we're talking both about preservation and also restoration with a specific focus on biodiversity at sea and on land. And we've also made a commitment to be fully part of the 1.5 degree trajectory, which supposes carbon neutrality in all of our activities and an important transition with 40% that you'll see on the next slide. And we've also made a commitment to have solutions with our 100% sustainable by 2030, which is to say have a positive impact on the fight against climate change. Impact positive sur and also a positive impact on biodiversity and a positive social impact as well. We've been working a lot on the carbon level and also as regards biodiversity in order to mainstream these elements into the way we run our business and how we offer solutions to our clients. And we apply these uh, to translate them into uh, concrete actions within society. We joined the Act for Nature International Initiative. We have 11 commitments, which you'll see in the next slide. Mainstreaming the strategy, the way in which we measure our environmental performance and uh, the sustainable development within the company, as well as the solutions that we offer to our customers. This is the framework within which we've mainstreamed all of these topics with, into our strategy. Now, nature-based solutions for water are clearly uh, at the core of the solutions that we're offering to our customers. I've uh, selected three examples here so that we can illustrate the type of commitments that we're undertaking. So uh, the first here is an industrial park which we manage in China where we deal with water, sanitation, uh, purification of wastewater and uh, uh, treatment of dangerous waste. This is the largest industrial park in China. It's located in Shanghai and we set up our first uh, so-called zone libellule, so dragonfly zone, which is uh, down a stream from the uh, purification areas. And this allows us to better manage the absorption of micropollutants using uh, plants which grow in these areas. This is something that we have implemented uh, in France in several projects, but it was, this was the first time that we uh, implemented it at scale in China. Another interesting example is the restoration or depollution of a lagoon in Qatar, the Al Karana Lagoon. It used to be a, a deposit zone before uh, Qatar invested in a, a plant for the treatment of industrial and domestic effluents. The authorities in Qatar decided to invest in uh, purification stations and uh, their aim was to reduce the pollution of this area. And this is what we did by creating 70 hectares worth of lagoons which store uh, treated wastewater. And this has allowed us to fully restore this area and uh, to allow fauna to return, particularly migratory birds. You can actually see some of these in uh, some of the following slides. They had previously left this area due to the pollution levels. The third example which was mentioned previously, is in Martinique. This is, the, uh, is part of the Artisan project. We managed this project, uh, the marina, 
And as part of this management, we implemented a project for extending mangroves in tropical areas, so CO2 storage allowing fish to reproduce, but also to protect the coast from the risk of submersion. So as part of this management strategy, we uh, have installed a lightweight structure which allows natural deposit of sediment and allows the mangrove to develop. And this uh, provides a natural barrier to protect the marina, which was exposed to risks such as cyclones previously. These are a few examples among many uh, nature-based solutions examples. We've also developed a carbon sink from algae using photosynthesis, which allows us to transform CO2 into biogas. These are ways in which uh, we believe that we can meet our aims for protecting the uh, natural capital, but also restoring biodiversity. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kemu. As we can see from these examples, uh, Suez has undertaken a number of uh, implementation uh, projects for nature-based solutions, and this is the case throughout the world. We've seen examples in China, Qatar, Martinique. I'd like to highlight here that there is a network of stakeholders which allows us to multiply these nature-based solutions among private stakeholders. And the CDP will be presenting this. Kate Lamb will be telling us about how this network aims to accelerate the adaptation of MBAs by uh, private actors. You have the floor. Thank you, Edward. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everybody that is joining us from far and wide today. I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, as Edward said, my name is Kate Lamb. Um, I'm the Global Director of Water Security for CDP. CDP, for those of you that may not know who we are, um, we're an international not-for-profit organization working to use the power of transparency to change the way the world does business. I've been running our global water program for a decade now, and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some of the insights into the way in which we work to accelerate the corporate adoption of nature-based solutions. So at CDP, we operate on behalf of institutional investors and large purchasing organizations. Indeed, this, the program this year runs on behalf of over 600 institutional investors with over a trillion, $100 trillion worth of assets under management and purchasing organizations, so large corporations who control over $50 trillion worth of uh, procurement spend. It's their power, their influence that we wield to um, require the world's largest, most impactful companies to provide water-related information to the market. We believe that it's this transparency that ultimately will help to deliver a true transformation in the way in which these corporations and the way in which financial institutions value water and indeed water-related ecosystems. Here in front of you, you can see the flow um, of our theory of change, which is the way in which we, we operate. We use our investors and purchasers of the authority to collect the information. The, um, the authority issues an information request, a questionnaire every year to the corporations, and the corporations report back via CDP, and we channel that information through to these financial influencers. So in 2020, just over 5,500 companies um, from a range of different sectors and a range of different countries were requested to disclose business critical information. This information spanned um, typical traditional water accounting information, so how much water did the company withdraw from what resources um, in which river basins, through to how and what steps are the companies taking to ensure that their boards, uh, CEOs, and the strategy that the companies are setting at that level are doing all it can to deliver a water secure world. 
the industries that we target are listed on the right, at least some of them. These are the world's largest water dependent and most water impactful sectors from a water quality perspective. These same companies represent the key, in our view, to triggering the transformation that we need to deliver the water secure, climate resilient future that we want. So I was delighted that of the 5,500 or so that we, that we invited to disclose, more than half, just under 3,000, actually responded um, to their request from their financial institutions. This means that CDP now holds the largest water-related database of corporate action on water globally. And we work to make this data set publicly available so that it can be used by a whole range of different stakeholders to make better, more informed decision making. And so what is this data telling us? Well, I look back a decade ago in preparation for the time today, for our time today together, to think about what was the state of corporate action with regards to nature-based solutions in particular, um, roughly a decade ago. And one of the topics I've focused in on was targets and goals that companies were setting. Co corporate target setting is an important pro process. The targets the companies set typically dictate the future direction that that company will travel in. And it shouts loudly about the items and the issues that companies have prioritized to deal with. Those issues that they feel are the most important to ensure the future success of their business. And so looking back a decade ago, we see that most companies, the vast majority, were focused on the rather traditional or, or vanilla types of targets, efficiency, absolute reduction in water withdrawals, and improvements in the, in the quality of their discharges. These are, of course, vital activities that companies should be taking in order to mitigate the impacts that they have on freshwater resources. However, as you know, there are certainly many more steps that they could take to enhance the, our overall chance of success. And so, recognizing that there was a, a lag, if you like, or perhaps a misunderstanding of the opportunities for investing in nature-related uh, and nature-based solutions, um, we started to engage our institutional investors, helping them understand that in their, in their the, the seat that they sit as, as a lever for change, that they can play a role in accelerating the adoption of nature-based solutions in the companies that they invest in, the companies that they loan to, or the companies that they insure. And excitingly, the, the investor attitude, the, the knowledge amongst the financial sector has really changed in this period. They now expect companies to develop a broader understanding of their water risks, recognizing that generally the health of the basin is synonymous with the health of the business. And that if nature is being destroyed, nature beyond the factory fence line, then that too will er erode um, financial performance of the company and in turn pose a greater risk to the portfolio that they have responsibility for managing. You can see here, on the right hand side that the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the largest pension fund on the planet, expect companies to report um, uh, uh, water related challenges that are, that are facing their business and that they should include basin, hydrological, environmental, social, economic and regulatory information as appropriate. It's really encouraging to see this improvement in investor understanding that if a company continues to pursue singular targets of efficiency, wastewater um, management, and absolute reductions in its water withdrawals, it will still be facing substantive risk because of these broader basin-related challenges and the destruction of nature that's taking place there. And so in response, in 2017, we began to bring nature into the boardroom. I designed a suite of questions that would sit within the questionnaire itself <laughs> that would aim to spark a dialogue on nature-related information and nature-based solutions that to date was clearly lacking within companies. We asked companies about the targets that they're setting with regards to nature-based um, solutions. We um, asked them to share their learnings about the, the, their experiences, and we track progress against the targets that they've set. Importantly, one of our other levers of change is that we score and rank companies publicly and so we started to weight nature-related indicators much more highly um, in, this, in this moment in 2017, sending a loud signal to the companies that are engaging with CDP that investing in nature-based solutions is indeed a priority and setting nature-related targets is a vital step in unlocking this potential that exists. 
these scores that are important because they are then loaded onto Bloomberg terminals and Google Finance and they're loaded into mainstream investment funds. And these are really powerful tools for change. So I'm really delighted to share with you that this effort seems to be bearing fruit and that we see here, we revisited again the types of water-related targets and goals that companies are setting for 2020. And already you can begin to see that companies have broadened their approach. They're taking a much more nuanced approach to tackling their water-related impacts and seizing opportunities to deliver better outcomes, not only for themselves, but also for the communities that are around them. Apologies for the slide transitions. So we do still see the traditional types of targets emerging, as you would expect. These indicators and targets are the things that companies can control. They are the easiest steps that they can take. However, we do see here that watershed remediation and habitat restoration is emerging as a really dominant target. And this is really exciting. Um, what this fundamentally indicates is that companies are beginning to recognize that the true value of water doesn't reside in the cost that they pay. Indeed, this merely reflects a, price, a, a, a blip on the profit and loss sheet, if it ever makes it there. It's worth remembering that these companies are multi-billion dollar companies, and so the cost of water isn't sufficient to grab their attention at the boardroom. But what they are waking up to is that the true value of water and the protection of water-related ecosystems through nature-based solutions resides instead in ensuring business continuity, ensuring that they maintain their license to operate, and that they can have opportunities to enhance their brand value by taking these really forward-thinking steps. And so why I remain optimistic and why I remain excited about this opportunity and why CDP remains committed to ensuring that all of the companies that disclose through CDP are taking actions on nature-related issues is because the business case for action is increasingly clear and compelling. And there's huge potential to harness corporate commitments in order to achieve water security. As you can see here, in 2020, corporations forecasted investing $5.5 billion in managing their water-related risks. If we work with them to direct even a fraction of this money into nature-based solutions, we have the potential to really accelerate the adoption of these solutions. It's my belief that transparency and accountability are powerful tools for realizing this potential. And I look forward to putting them to work on behalf of all of us here today. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, thank you, Kate, for, for this. It's true that we see that from the transparency, from the accountability, from the assessment of the actions that companies uh, are taking, we get in return uh, incentive, financial incentives to do even better. Uh, and that helps the change that we've seen uh, with uh, the uh, exemplary actions from Suez, uh, with the uh, network uh, cloud, the power uh, of, of CDP in, in pushing uh, the work of companies further. So thank you for that. We've seen the presentation of the Artisan project with uh, national flagship uh, pilot project. We've seen what the private sectors, uh, what the private sector was doing. Uh, and now I would like to uh, go into specific actions, national-based actions from Suriname as well as uh, from Benin. So we will first head to uh, Mr. Minister Riyad Nour Mohamed, uh, and I would like to ask you what are the nature-based solutions both uh, inland uh, and along the shore uh, of Suriname that were implemented to uh, limit the impacts uh, of climate change in particular. Uh, Mr. Riyad Nour Mohamed, you have the floor. You can join me, yeah. Yes, Edward, thank you very much. Uh, everyone also welcome. Um, um, I will present to you a few cases, three cases, very short because of the time limitation. Um, and of course, the thematic is, is water and biodiversity through all the examples. And as you all know, uh, indeed, climate change, we have heard it has impact. Uh, especially, I will only focus on uh, floods and droughts, so high, high water and very low water that has its impact on, 
on different sectors, agriculture, life, drinking water supply, but also the biodiversity. So through some examples, I will show you uh, in general what we are experiencing. So let's go back to South America. There is the location of Suriname. On the left side, you have the map. And of course, uh, we have a lot of um, uh, forest and a lot of water, but that doesn't mean that we, we, we um, have the water where it should be always. And on the right side, you see the coastal zone where everyone lives. Most of the activities are there. Economic activities, the roads, uh, the majority of people live there, let's say 80%. But if we have high, high water or floods, we have a problem. You remember that the last weeks, months, we had floods in uh, Europe. Well, we had the same in Suriname. It was a big disaster. And as a minister of public health, you can imagine that I didn't sleep for many weeks. <laughs> But um, so this is the reality. So if you have uh, floods, it causes a lot of damage. Um, we also have the situation. Uh, this is another map, but still the coastal zone showing you the different um, uh, fresh and brackish um, lagoons, wetlands. So as you remember, as you know from your experience, they have a very high biodiversity. We have many tourists coming only there for bird watching or fishing. We have a lot of people earning their income from these um, uh, uh, swamps, these uh, very um, high biodiversity areas for different purposes, even if it's ecotourism or, or on another sector. This is my first case. So um, I saw in one of the other presentations the uh, um, problem of uh, coastal erosion. We have along the coast in general a lot of uh, mangroves. Um, and this is an area close to the main capital, Paramaribo, and the question till now is should we build a dike, so a, um, a concrete dike, or should we use another method? So we are supporting uh, the building of uh, a green dike, which is a clay dike, but in combination with the mangrove. And so you see uh, the situation is very, very critical. And we all know that mangroves have a very important role. In the case of Suriname, along the coast of South America, it's especially for uh, breeding of different aquatic species like fish, screams, uh, crabs, everyone like these things. But we have also in this area a very particular uh, um, a thing that is uh, beekeeping, so very, um, uh, a very good quality. And um, of course, this is a cheaper technology, you have the tools already. You don't need to import things like concrete or, or other materials. We have the local materials that can help us. So at the end, we want to make this a sustainable project. And you see in the pictures um, the, the, the way we are doing it. I think in the other presentations, we have also seen this methodology, building some, some uh, how do you say it in English? Um, um, with, with some material, local material like bamboo, and so the sediments come, and you finally can can let your um, mangrove uh, grow there and protect your coastal area. This is another case. Uh, this is the case in the west of Suriname. The big lagoons, fresh uh, brackish water. There are many activities. A lot of people find their income there. So we need to protect local communities. This is along the sea. So as I told you, uh, seawater comes inside, or sometimes it breaks the local dams. So everyone will scream, OK, yes, then build a dike immediately. Then the problem will be solved for always. Well, we haven't chosen for that way. We rehabilitate it with hand. So uh, built it with nature. Uh, because, for example, this is an area where you have also fishing, um, uh, a lot of people come for bird watching, uh, etc. And uh, specific animals are here. So you see on the right a picture that we didn't have it for many, many years. The, um, I don't know the English word, but the red birds, the ibis. Yeah, they, they are back. So um, imagine how nice that is. So this is another way how we want to recover nature without uh, 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 creating other damage uh, in such an area. And the last case I wanted to present to you is um, uh, the case of the interior, so the south of Suriname. And we have some partners here. This project was also presented yesterday, where you see on the left side a map of Suriname. And you see that, yes, almost one third of the rivers I mentioned before, the freshwater rivers, are polluted because of gold mining. So we have small scale, uncontrolled, but and we also have large scale, those are controlled mining. So this is a disaster. Uh, 
And we have neighbors like French Guyana and Guyana, they also have the same problem. So um, from our side in 2050, we started to rehabilitate our, our hydraulic network. So we first need to put in place some good observations. What is happening? What is the damage, etc. cetera? And um, in this area, we have people living in the inland, a few hundred, a few, uh, yeah, let's say something like uh, 20, 30,000 people. They are living from the water, from the rivers. They find their food in the forest. They find their food in the, in the, in the water, in the rivers. Um, uh, so it's a big concern for us. So also together with, uh, this is a map. This is, the, this is a project we have started with our neighbors, uh, French Guyane, um, by putting more observation stations, so hydraulic and, and um, uh, stations to measure um, the aquatic life in the river um, to see what is happening and how we can take action. So the actions needs to go to the government. Uh, this is a huge project and um, it should give answer to, at the end, the governments to take actions. Um, and so on the left side, to conclude, I have put uh, the website so you can find some more information what uh, these projects are doing for the countries in the in the case of um, uh, protecting nature in uh, Suriname. Thank you. This is all I wanted to say at this moment. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you very much, Minister, for having explained to us here the different challenges of pollution and uh, mining operations from gold mining in particular and the consequences that has for water and the consequences of coastal flooding the risk of marine submersion and nature-based solutions and the role they can play in meeting those challenges. Thank you very much for your speech. And now we'll be having a look uh, here at continental flooding in Burkina Faso in the Akwe River Basin. And oh, no, sorry, the Wimeu uh, River and uh, Lake Akwe from the um, Mr. Marla Odol has the floor now, if you can hear me, sir. Thank you very much. I shall try to have a screen share. Good morning to everyone. As was just said, I will be very rapidly be telling you about the results of a project that we have rolled out. to solve certain flooding problems that have been recurring in Benin for some time now. So this is called the Integrated Solution for the Weme Valley. It involves various structures put forward with our different partners. This is capping over a 10 to 15 year timeline with a particular target of 3 to 15 percent of runoff reduction in that area. And just for memory, the project was funded by the Seine Normandy Water Agency in France. For those who are not familiar with Benin, let me tell you that we have four major hydrographic areas. The first one is here in Volta. On the upper left of the map, then the Niger hydrographic area and Monokufo. And these three are all transboundary areas. The only one that is entirely within our country is the fourth one, Wemeyewa, which is a little bit shared with Nigeria, but it's basically entirely within our country. And most of the flooding problems we have in that region, uh, which involve our major city, Kotonu, come from this particular basin. And so the activity we have implemented here is focused on that geographic area. The Wemi River Basin has a surface of 47,218 square kilometers. And 
covers 41 percent of our total geography. It's a big part of our country, otherwise said. And so this is, covers eight different departments and 48 communities of the 77 that we have in our country in total. We estimate that 6 million of our inhabitants live in this part of the country, 44 percent of the total population. And the projections we have up to 2025 give a protection of almost 10 million people living in this area. So the river basin is divided into four sub-basins, Zu, Okpara, Upper Wimi, and Lower and Middle Wimi Valley. As I said earlier, this is, there are different forms of fallout. Sometimes they are positive as well for the populations as well. It has been shown that when the water level changes, the soil becomes more fertile and different crops can be planted in that period. There are also river sediments which uh, settle here, and they can be used for farming purposes as well. The local populations for a long time now have developed their own strategies to adapt to the water level rising and falling. We see houses built on stilts which allow the people who live in them to be able to take greater advantage of some of the resources provided by floods. But floods have become greater and greater, as I've been saying, for the last 10 or 15 years. And we are noting that they can be devastating and indeed fatal as they were in 2010, which that flood brought about enormous losses. It was one of the most unusual floods that we've had in Benin. We've also noted that during that period of catastrophic flooding, even with houses on stilts, people found themselves with water inside their homes or were at less than 50 centimeters above the water, even when their houses were built in that way. So this also disturbs our major city, Kotonou, because in 2010, the whole city, basically, 80 to 90 percent of the city was affected by these floods. Given all of this, we are also noting some factors which can explain some of this in Benin. There is one ethnic group we call Tafis, people who are born on the water. And what's happening with climate change when it doesn't rain, if we have a less rainy year than usual, we don't see a flooding population for two or three years. People who are not used to this and people who live on plateaus think that, well, okay, that's fine. We can go work in these areas where the land is more fertile and where it's relatively damp compared to other areas. So people move toward those areas to practice farming or other activities. And then during those same dry periods, instead of building a house on stilts, people think, well, it's been dry for a while now. So they build brick houses, as people do on higher lands on the plateau, so that then when floods do come back, those areas are devastated and enormous problems are caused. So how do these floods actually occur? Let me say that Benin has various geographic figures. You see here in the lower and middle Wemi Valley, we have sedimentary soil. And in the, southern, the northern part of the basin, we also have a crystalline base for the soil. And so when all the water that falls in that period between June and October, this rain tries to descend from the north to the south. So water is circulating in that direction, and all of that water is, as I say, trying to move toward the Atlantic Ocean to, by moving to the south. And so this starts in June and July. And that water moving south is then 
met by very heavy rainfall in the period between September and October in the middle part of the river valley. And that water, those rainfalls, further increased the amount of total water in the runoff. And then during this period, the Atlantic Ocean, and we've seen this with oceanographic studies in that period, September and October, the Atlantic Ocean is a sort of receptacle for the water that flows down the river. But this, in fact, creates flooding when the water goes back into the lower part of the valley because the ocean cannot simply absorb it all. So they have basically a combination of intense rainfall that has been made even stronger by climate change and then a wearing out of the soil uh, through effects such as deforestation and other uh, and, and uh, single crop farming and density of the population, all of which mean that there is even greater water runoff than before for the same quantity of rainfall. So we need to have various forms of adaptation and to have work done in these areas so that the impact of climate change may be mitigated. We've rolled out various different activities which are nature-based solutions. First of all, I could say that this project is made of three parts. The first part concerns governance and a knowledge of integrated management of water resources and of flooding. Then we have different adaptation measures that we put in place with demonstrations and other activities. And then and, and support for those actions to become ongoing. And then thirdly, we have in the whole river evasion concerned uh, an ongoing mechanism for these systemic actions. This happens on three different levels. First of all, for the whole Weme River Basin the catchment area, we have this idea of a river basin community which has been formed and brings together players and users in the whole river basin. So we've tried to have consciousness raising there. We've talked about nature-based solutions in general, and people, I think, are now much more aware of these solutions. Then we also have in the lower and middle river valley, we've worked out a risk management plan for flooding with the aid of our French partners. And then we have in these three hydrological units, concrete activities to show the populations concerned how they can work to retain water in the soil rather than let it flow onward. And so here we have a governance plan, if you will, and also knowledge plans. These are the studies we've carried out. There was a stock taking of the knowledge and practices on an endogenous level of uh, conservation, what's already being done in terms of water and soil to be as resilient as possible. We also had a vulnerability study vis-a-vis -vis climate change that has allowed us to have some conclusions drawn on these changing parameters on which we're attempting to act so as to slow down water runoff, uh, erosion, and flooding. This consciousness raising happened using different tools, including these small posters that we have designed, what we call an image box, a card game, so the games and playing can also transmit knowledge about nature-based solutions, and then a model of the river basin. In terms of governance as such, we have set up a consultation mechanism around water and the communities that use water. I was telling you about the model of the river basin. Here it is, and we can often explain this to the populations concerned who are often illiterate. 
And if we can show them if they're on the plateau, there are certain activities they can have, such as small dikes that will allow them to try to block off water runoff upstream, which is also great assistance in this whole process. Here we have the card game I was telling you about which will allow people to try to better understand what's going on. So the water community also plays a, a regulatory role in conflicts which sometimes occur. You can see on this photo there is a very small body of water which is not being maintained at all. And then here you see that there are people who are able to develop strategies to help to manage it. And so here we have, for instance, different farming activities and what happens when you're flooding compared to what happens when you're not flooding to show to allow all of these stakeholders to manage the water resources. We also have a strategic system as well as other tools that we've implemented. Here are some pictures of what we've been doing, supporting populations to halt uh, runoff, improve soil capacity for infiltration, and improve resilience. So these are the nature-based solutions for water that we've uh, implemented. Uh, they are simple uh, planning solutions that are easily reprodu reproduced by populations that improve the capacity for regulation of runoff, uh, allow to increase the infiltration capacity and water retention capacity of the soil. We have a system which allows us to improve uh, poor soils and uh, we use a, a roughness system with dams. And in some cases we've uh, uh, excavated uh, the uh, water basin in order to prevent water stagnation. There's also the IUCN uh, standard for nature-based solution and we want to uh, continue to implement this criteria and fight against uh, environmental degradation and loss of biodiversity. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup, uh, monsieur. Thank you very much, Mr. Medard Daudot. As we've heard, uh, nature-based solutions in farming, in this case, are uh, measures that uh, nobody regrets. These are the types of uh, projects that we wish to promote through the um, African projects uh, system that we've put in place. So thank you for sharing that with us. We've uh, visited France, Suriname, Benin, and the Caribbean. And now I'd like to hear from the room uh, if there are any questions for our panel. I've heard that there are two questions from the room, so please introduce yourself when I give you the microphone. Hello, Franck Moutoun. I'd like to thank the minister from Suriname for his presentation and for presenting the challenges uh, in uh, Suriname, which is unique and which uh, we represent. He's uh, shared with us pathways to move forward with nature-based solutions for water. I also listened very closely to the different uh, uh, presentations, and there are two questions I'd like to ask. The first is for Mr. Camus for, uh, of uh, Suez. I listened very closely to your presentation. Uh, we're currently in Marseille. Is Suez undertaking any nature-based solutions uh, in this area? That was my first question. And the second is for Mr. Medan Daudo from Benin. He mentioned ecosystem services. And if I've understood correctly, there 
might be a tax system in Bina in this regard. Could you explain in further detail? Thank you very much. Before I give the floor to our speakers, I'll take uh, three more questions and then we'll move on to the question, to the answers. Thank you very much. Joël Rouillet, CNRS economist. I have uh, one question which is for Mr. Tardieu and Madame Lory. It seems that there is uh, a conciliation between theory and practice. Mr. Touré mentioned the profitability of nature-based solutions. Now, perhaps uh, it's optimistic to state that if we internalized all externalities, And even without internalizing these externalities, even if the carbon price is rather low, this is something that could work. So my first question is, what do we need to do? Who do we need to convince? And secondly, Do we convince people through projects, through practice? And it's true that when it comes to projects, we need uh, major uh, efforts in terms of capacity building. And then when it comes to um, concrete projects, they are usually successful, whereas nature-based solutions are not always successful. So how steep is the learning curve? Are we talking about five years or ten years? Noor Mohammed, Mr. Minister, you had uh, given examples on mangrove preservation or on mangrove reconstitution. My question is very simple. Do you see a, a possible funding of those kind of projects by the global community, by the Green Climate Fund or by the GEF? And do you foresee a possible coalition at the global level or Global South for, or for those kind of projects, or not just the Global South, because France is a marine, uh, is a marine country as well, uh, from South America, Caribbean, to Africa, to uh, the Indian Ocean uh, and Southeast Asia. There are many projects of uh, mangrove rebuilding. Isn't it time uh, for a global co coalition, either at the COP26 or the COP15 or both? Thank you so much. And thank you for, to the organizers for an excellent panel. Thank you for that. And it's true, we know that uh, NBS will be one of the major topics of COP26, so that's a welcome comment. Sir? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Paul Vetterhaal. I am um, working for the Dutch uh, Nature Conservation Society, Natuurmonumenten. I have a question for Mr. Noor Mohammed from Suriname. Um, I was very uh, impressed by your uh, presentation about the examples you gave um, and especially as the speaker before also mentioned uh, the, the mangrove projects um, i think your coast is really threatened by the rising sea level so and you gave some examples and i'm wondering whether um, these examples are part of um, a mainstream solution for for the whole uh, suriname coast or it's still in the let's say in the in in the way of some cases in the Netherlands, we have the same, the, uh, a similar problem. You low-lying country, a lot of coast. Uh, the, the coastal line is long for our small country. We we don't have um, uh, mangroves, of course, but but we have tidal marshlands. And my organisation is working together with some other um, nature organisations and parts of the authorities on um, uh, expanding mangroves as nature-based solutions comparable with your, ma uh, sorry, um, marshlands comparable with your mangroves. But it's not yet um, mainstream in the Netherlands. We have a rich country um, with a long history on um, civil technology and it is um, a rather tough thing to convince the um, technicians and the authorities that nature-based solutions would be the best mainstream solution. So, um, in your country, uh, you mentioned the, um, uh, the fact that you actually need local products to work with because of um, economical reasons. Um, the Netherlands is, um, well, it, it's a richer country and they, w we use a lot of, um, um, let's say, expensive um, methods. Would you, should you recommend nature-based solutions also for country, countries 
who have a strong history in civil technology and also um, uh, are relatively rich. Um, a, a last thing I would mention here, this afternoon at half past three, um, in uh, Hall 3, in the Dutch Pavilion, we are going to explain something about our, um, our Dutch um, experiences with nature-based solutions for coastal, um, uh, for, for climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. And maybe we'll start uh, with you then, Mr. Minister, for the two questions that were uh, asked to you. I give you the mic. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So, indeed, both questions um, uh, were in the field of the mangrove ecosystems. And yes, um, the first one was indeed funding. How easy is it to get funding, access to funding? It's not so easy. By the time uh, you have uh, uh, written your proposal, get the money, you are five years further. So, and then your cost is damaged. So, we don't, uh, this is really critical for uh, funding agencies that we have to uh, make proposals. Uh, funding much faster available uh, and I know that you need to write good things etc but it doesn't work in practice we have other agencies where you write a proposal and within two weeks you get an answer so uh, this is something we need to be aware to you know international funding agencies so uh, in the case of nature-based solutions I always say um, those are solutions locally, so uh, uh, let the private sector, the government first start because those uh, are not very expensive things. We have local NGOs, international NGOs, also uh, in most countries represented. So we also ask them to find uh, ways to bring in some funding. And in general, these are small funding projects, so that is very good. Uh, sometimes you don't need the big money. Start first with a small thing, show that your project is successful, and then you can extend in need, write something for five or ten years further. Um, so yes, we will. We have for many times uh, made this aware. Uh, for sure, my colleague who is working in this field from the University of Suriname, we have uh, uh, Ms. Usha uh, uh, present here. Um, at the COP meetings, different COP meetings, uh, we presented this project, I think also in the Netherlands uh, a few years ago during a special congress. So we will continue in this way uh, to do that. And yes, the coast, the whole coast is uh, a very low-lying area. Suriname, the coast is a very low-lying area. Um, but the problem exists at particular places, if I can continue with the answer of, of, of uh, our Dutch colleague. Um, uh, so as I said, nature-based solutions, it has its advantages. Uh, that sometimes most of people don't know. If you don't know nothing about biodiversity or the aquatic life, you will think nothing is there important. But as I showed you, this, the, the mangroves are for sure now the most important place for uh, fish breeding. Uh, 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 but the majority of the people don't know that. They think the fish uh, 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 are created in the sea. No, they come to breathe along the coast. And most of the people don't know that. So once you become aware of the aquatic life, the origin, etc., they will come aware. So we are in the uh, in the beginning of some success stories. We have already um, executed a pilot project in this field, and so we will continue uh, in this field. And as you know, um, uh, hydraulic structures are very expensive. Um, we are not able who um, facilitate all those facilities. So yes, as a Minister of Public Works now in place, I am uh, looking for uh, opportunities to invest in green infrastructure, if I can call it like that. Thank you. We now have Mr. Edouard de Daudo to answer the question on tax systems. You have the floor. Thank you very much to the participant who asked about the tax system in Bina to fund the solutions that we've implemented. As I mentioned, as part of nature-based solutions, we began implementing them with the Senimalne uh, organization since 2009. In Bina, there is a polluter pace mechanism 
which could introduce levies to address the issue of funding interventions. The second method is mechanism is the payment for ecosystem services which we're developing. We are currently uh, uh, developing these solutions. We've brought together stakeholders and decision makers in November 2020 to address this issue of uh, pathways towards implementing a uh, payment for ecosystem services system. And talks are still underway to ensure that uh, soon we should be able to implement these solutions with the uh, water agency and set up the payment for ecosystem services system. It's not functional at the moment, but discussions are underway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Camus. Nature-based solutions in Marseille. Yes. Uh, in Marseille, Suez uh, manages the water treatment plants and uh, water collection points for around 20 million inhabitants. We work with the local authorities of Marseille-Provence. We have invested greatly to in um, water treatment and the collection of rainwater during storms last Friday installations uh, have actually been built um, near this uh, congress center which allow us to draw on natural resources which is a priority in order to allow biodiversity to flourish we are conducting experiments it's a very interesting area for us we have two projects underway one is uh, creating fish nurseries in two ports, we imitate Poseidonic algae, which allows uh, juvenile fish to develop in these areas. So that's our first pilot project, experimental project. And the second is the Cytocera algae which are a marker of the quality of natural sites if they've been affected by human activity related pollution. So this algae has returned to some parts of the water so we can measure performance and accelerate its return with transplants in certain areas. So these are some examples of what we've been doing in Marseille. Thank you very much. Madame Mattel de Lory from the OFB on the internalizations of uh, NSB costs. Yes, before internalizing externalities, I think it is important to uh, address the co-benefits of nature-based solutions and to share them among those who live in the areas which will directly benefit from them. And as regards infiltration of water, these are uh, often financed by water agencies. The co-benefit is that We create landscape nodes which reduce the temperature. And this is something that we've been doing uh, in collaboration with the university in Lille. And the Lille authorities have even uh, considered opening schools in the summer for local uh, populations thanks to this action. Now, as regards costs, it's not always a given <coughs> that uh, the uh, functioning or operationing rates uh, and uh, the other uh, costs are all taken into account. If we want to be able to compare them, we need to take into account these figures. Now, in Guyane, we've been working on uh, urban runoff, and the cities of uh, Cayenne 
pay a very high cost for treating these canals. So we use uh, species, not invasive species, but specially selected species for low impact on biodiversity. And this allows us to reduce the cost of operation. And this provides a direct benefit for local authorities. Another important aspect is that in certain cases, NBS can have a benefit for society, but not for the person that implemented them. In the case of the catchment area in Bretagne, in Brittany, restoring uh, the wetlands on their plots is sometimes seen as a loss of revenue. So we need to work with them to show them that actually for their farms, it can generate benefits. And this requires uh, specific measures, not just financial, but also technical and agricultural. Thank you very much. A few extra points to answer the question further. I think today we've already seen how much the private sector, even more than uh, consciousness raising, are actually counting hard figures, and I think we've already seen in one of the presentations that the business model is already known and is really encouraging people to scale up and to use nature-based solutions. And I think there is one sector where we in the water community could work even more. It's the insurance sector because there's an economic externality aspect there, which is an important part of the economic model. Uh, the, it's an externality that has to be managed. Then secondly, in terms of obstacles to be overcome in the public sector, there is this idea of a different vision over time of nature-based solutions. There is a different balance between investment and functioning, which are categories for public funds which are rather different and are managed different in public accounting and also in terms of political reasoning. So this is, I think, a way forward in our work which is important to ensure that politicians, I'm reasoning for France, but I think the same is true in many other countries as well. There's a need to demonstrate what is going on, to emphasize our efforts and to show that these solutions are more profitable when we're in a position to see them over a longer time span. And that is a habit that uh, public accounting doesn't have and that political life doesn't have. And I think that's something we'll need to work on harder. Thank you very much for that very rich exchange. I think we've covered a wide variety of aspects and we've ended up with some considerations on insurance and the impact that we would wish to have in nature-based solutions. Insurers have already told us that a world at more than 2.5 percent degrees warmer than today will not be an insurable world. And markets are also saying we aren't going to be able to go on like this. Change will happen fast and financial flows will be reoriented as we've already seen in all of the presentations we heard today. We haven't much time left and I'd like to begin our conclusions, and here I'll give the floor to Marie-Laure Vergam, who is Director General of the French Partnership for Water. Thank you very much, Edouard. A few words on the French Partnership for Water that you're probably not very familiar with. This is a multi-actor platform which has the status of an association and brings together most of the major players in France in water who are internationally active. We're very pleased to have the CNRS among our members, the AO, the Saint Normandy Water Agency, the initiative for the future of our major rivers uh, is chaired by Eric Orsena. And here the idea is to make sure that the water agenda and water issues find their proper place on the major international agenda. And nature-based solutions in the water context are a subject that we are going to go on talking about in, Gas in Glasgow and the Climate COP in major conferences, for instance, on the food chain in the United Nations, nature-based solutions in farming, and then also in high-level political fora on sustainable development goals. 
We've also contributed to this by publishing an invitation to French communities to take them by the hand and show them how they can implement nature-based solutions in water. And we'd really like you to come and have a look at our internet site uh, or come see us here in the room if these things are of interest to you. And before I give the f microphone to Eric Orsena, I'd like to remind you of a few figures that came up during this Congress. First of all, in the last years, we have lost, according to IUCN, 90 percent of the population of fresh water organisms, 90 percent and 80 percent of certain organisms in the world. And another figure, according to the UN report on water resource development, Water-based, uh, sorry, nature-based solutions represent 1% of the funding of water in the world. 1%. Eric, over to you. So thank you very much for that extremely interesting survey of the world. So w what's happening with rivers? It's a bit the same thing. I'm thinking quite a lot with the Academy of Science on a relationship with knowledge. And what we see here in our societies is that there is a criticism of knowledge as something that is external to us. And then a second phase is that we have a difficult time believing things that we already know. Even if we know something, it doesn't mean we've really got there. And what interests me a great deal in these nature-based solutions is that nature is a character that we know. It's not something abstract. So why have we created this association for the future of big rivers? Because I'd worked a lot on water, and obviously I've gone doing so. But water is an absolutely necessary substance, but it's something kind of abstract, whereas every river has a personality, is a character in a story. And so what interests me here in nature-based solutions is that at the end of the day, we're identifying characters from nature. That's why there's such a big movement to give legal status, what we call personality in French as well, to some of these elements, the idea of ownership of a story and the idea of being able to tell that story. And this is something which interests me greatly. The second thing is that in all the examples that we've showed, we see that we're talking about geography, specific geography, singular river basins. And here again, this is something which is not abstract. It's, it's, it, if you have a chunk of concrete, it would be the same everywhere. But a plant will be different from one place to another, and a mangrove will be different from one place to another. So here we have diversity. And we're responding to the precipitous fall off in biodiversity by talking about diversity of the means we bring to bear here. Otherwise, it would be contradictory to fight for diversity with singular, non-diverse resources. And as much as I like to talk about ideas, I don't like generalities. And here, over and above the weight of geography, I think we have to have a look at the time factor. And you said this very clearly, I think. Solutions that are not natural solutions are short-term solutions. And that corresponds to modes of funding. And it corresponds also to the political timeline. People want to see immediate effectiveness of what's been launched before the end of a political term. But as you said very, very correctly, I think, and that was fascinating because it was entirely relevant. What is the depth of time here? We're talking about water. And there's this relationship between water and time, which always seemed to me extremely precise. So at the end of the day, talking about nature, using nature, is not simply being effective, but it's a form of evaluation, but evaluated over what time frame? One year, five years, 10 years? I was with the Army fighting against the floods in the Mississippi, and those were questions we asked. Are we talking about two years or five years? And then what will the overall cost be? 
depending on what we've said. So what I find really fascinating in these matters is the geography, that's the space and interactions, and at the same time, the time frame. So why are we telling this story? Well, you'll have to excuse me if I'm talking about my own personal experience and speaking as myself. But when you move from water to rivers and from being an economist to being a novelist, and I don't want to say I prefer the second thing to the first because the two things need to be linked. But the idea of telling a story is not something useless when you're trying to bring knowledge forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you all for your attention. Thank you to all of our speakers who are here physically and those who are present online. And of course, we invite you to go on following our program. And for us, that will be in the French Pavilion in a few moments when we will be presenting our project, as we said earlier, in the French Pavilion. Thank you all very much indeed.